I read a story recently, and I want to share it with you in the most PG way possible, for it is not a, a PG story. But trust me, it's, it's relevant and, and, and necessary. And it's about this guy who loves his wife. And she says that she loves him as well, but she's not faithful to him. In fact, she steps out on him all the time. And she used to try and hide it and, and make excuses, but now she doesn't even bother. She just leaves and sticks him at home with the kids and sometimes she's gone for days, sometimes she's gone for weeks, and sometimes she doesn't even come home at all. And he heard through the grapevine that she was selling herself to random men, and he found out where this was happening, and he went and he got her, and he convinced her to come home, and she stayed home for a while, but then she got restless again, and, and she just, just left. And all the neighbors kind of look at him funny. I mean, they know what's, what's going on. Her reputation is, is well known. And in fact, some of the neighbors know about her reputation firsthand. And nobody says anything to his face, but they all kind of laugh at him behind his back. It's the scandal that everyone loves to talk about. And some of the more self-righteous people judge him and sneer at him and, and they won't allow their children to play with his children, that sort of thing. But some of the neighbors feel sorry for him. They pity him. And you can see the pity in their eyes as, as if to say, you know, don't you have any dignity? Don't you have any self-respect? And it makes him feel weak and pathetic and emasculated, but he just can't help it because he loves his wife and he will continue to love his wife and he will continue to, to take her back. And some of you ask, well, pastor, you know, why and where would you be reading a story like that? Well, it's actually a story in the Bible from the book of Hosea. And it's the story of Hosea and his prostitute wife, Gomer. And the story is meant to be a picture of God and his relationship with Israel. As Israel was repeatedly unfaithful to God, God continued to love Israel and take her back. And there's a couple of passages in Hosea, and, and you don't necessarily need to turn there just to demonstrate that that's what's going on in the book. Hosea 2.21 says, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Hosea 4.12, a spirit of prostitution leads them astray. They are unfaithful to their God. One of the interesting things about the Hosea story, or at least it's very interesting to me, is that it was God who told Hosea to love this woman. That it was God who told Hosea to marry Gomer, this adulteress, and this prostitute. And here's the point. The whole point is the scandal of it all. Hosea is a righteous and faithful man. He is a good husband and father. He treats Gomer well. In fact, he treats her very well, far better than she deserves. And she doesn't appreciate it. And she doesn't honor their marriage. In fact, she goes out and does the most shameful things, the most carnal things, the most disgraceful things with other men. And then here's Hosea just taking her back time and time again. And, and we react against that. We don't like it. 
especially those of us who have a high view of the sovereignty and glory of God. And we think to ourselves, you know, Hosea can't represent God. God can't be the picture of the cuckold husband. He can't come off as, as weak and pathetic and emasculated. The whole thing is absolutely scandalous. But we have to remember that the passage is not intended to communicate the glory and sovereignty of God. That's not the purpose of the story. There are other passages that talk about the sovereignty and glory of God, and they do it very well, and they lift him very high because he is sovereign. But that's not what this passage is intended to communicate. It is intended to communicate God's unrelenting love towards his wayward children. It's intended to communicate his grace. Furthermore, this isn't the only passage in the scriptures where we see this type of language and this type of imagery used to describe God. In fact, it's not even the focal passage for the message today. I only use it to highlight, once again, the scandal of grace and to demonstrate that this scandal is, is all throughout the Scriptures. The passage I want to use today actually comes from the New Testament, and it's a, it's a familiar story. It's the story of the prodigal son. And if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Luke chapter 15. And we'll pick it up in, in verse 11. And it reads like this. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here... I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and, and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to, the, said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, in all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found." 
Once again, we see the God figure in the story, which is the father embroiled in controversy. Now, the father is presented as the head of a very large household with many holdings and servants. As such, he is undoubtedly the richest, most powerful, and influential person in the entire household, the entire little community that revolves around this home. And as such, he would have been a leader in the larger community and in that region, being one of the major landowners, major householders. Uh, he would have been one of the richest, most influential and powerful men in that region, but he's also presented as a godly man, a man who is kind, compassionate, and righteous. And this father has two sons, and one of his sons is, is rash and hedonistic, and this is the, the younger son. And he goes to his father, and he asks him if he can have his half of the inheritance now. And this was a very unusual request. Because back then, fathers did not bestow an inheritance prior to them passing or being too feeble to manage the estate. And that's usually what happened. But it's clear that the father is still in control. He's managing the estate. And yet to everyone's surprise, the father gives this unwise, ungrateful, entitled son his half of the inheritance at great personal cost to himself. For people of wealth, people of means, just don't have half of their net worth lying around liquid. It's tied up. Back then, it would have been tied up in, in property and land and cattle and animals and servants and, and all of these types of things. And imagine what it would be, the effort that it would take to go and, and liquidate half of that so that you could then give it to this son who wants to go squander it with this bohemian lifestyle. And so this, in and of itself, would have had people shaking their heads because it just isn't done. And so the son takes half of this, really what would, would be a fortune, this huge windfall, this huge sum of money, and he doesn't use it to, to buy his own property or to start his own enterprise or to set himself up in any way. He just goes and indulges himself till every last dime is gone. Now I want you to imagine the richest person you know today. Hopefully you know someone that's a millionaire, maybe even worth several millions of dollars and let's just say for the sake of argument, and I hope this is true about this person, that this person is a wonderful, kind, compassionate, generous Christian person. That they're a strong and mature Christian in every sense of that word and in every sense that that word is good. And now I want you to imagine this person, again, liquidating half of their net worth. And even today, people who, who have means... Do not have that just lying around liquid. It's in stocks. It's in real estate. It's in mutual funds. It's, it's all over the place, and it's not easy to liquidate that kind of money. But this person that you know, the wealthiest person that you know, let's just say for the sake of argument, they go through all of the trouble to liquidate half of their net worth and then simply hand it over to their lazy, unwise, entitled son who doesn't respect them, who doesn't respect their values and beliefs and runs off to Vegas or Miami or New York to hit the clubs and just start rolling out money on luxury items and, and women and drugs and alcohol. And here's the thing. People know Right, if, if someone of means begins selling stuff and liquidating stuff, somebody somewhere knows. Maybe the neighbors know. Maybe the close friends know. Like, hey, what happened to your beach house? 
You know, what happened to, to this property you had over here? And, and certainly people in the family know what's going on. And they know what they did with the money. And they know the character of this young man, and so they can only imagine how he's spending this money. And he's probably on Facebook. He's probably tweeting all this garbage that he's doing. So really, everybody in the whole world knows, and none of them approve. I mean, just imagine what people are thinking. This is what's happening in the story of the prodigal son. So this boy in the story, I won't call him a man, the son in the story goes out and just blows his entire inheritance. Maybe it took him a few months, maybe a year or two, but it's, it's gone. All his money-grubbing friends are gone. He has nothing left and no one to help him. And he's longing for the husks of the corn that people feed to pigs. And I don't know about you, but I thought about that because I've shut corn and I've seen the husks. And I don't even know if they're edible. And even if you could eat them, would they even sustain someone? And this is what this young man is longing for. This is the equivalent today of being homeless and living out of dumpsters. And so people walk by him now, and they look at him with contempt. I bet a lot of his former associates and acquaintances, maybe some of the leeches that latched onto him when he was just making it rain, you know, maybe they see him, and you know what they think? There's a pathetic waste of a human being who has no one to blame but himself. And so there he is, lying in his own filth and poverty and despondency and then he has this epiphany and he thinks you know all those people that work for my father his employees his servants they all have food on the table they have a they have a roof over their heads and and yeah they work hard but they really don't have it all that bad I'm going to go home and apologize and ask my father for a job. But he instinctively knows how offensive his behavior was. He fully realizes that his father could not disapprove more. That his behavior went against everything that his father stands for. Because he knows his father. He knows he's a righteous man. He knows his morals. He knows his work ethic. He knows everything about his father. And he knows that his father has every right to spurn him and turn him away. In fact, he's probably thinking to himself, you know, that's what I would do. Because I think that's what most people would do. And so he begins to rehearse this little speech in his head. Oh, father, I've I've sinned against you and God. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And so he slinks home in disgrace, probably expecting the worst, but hoping for crumbs. Now, put yourself in the father's place. Here's this son of yours who you raised right to do the right things, to work hard, to sacrifice, to honor his parents. And then he took his inheritance and you gave it to him and he went out and he squandered half of everything you had. Half of everything you worked to build your entire life. All the sweat, all the blood, all the sacrifice of doing things the right way, doing the right things honoring God, honoring your family, being responsible. And then he goes out and he squanders it in the most shameful and disgraceful ways possible. And now that he's out of money, he comes home expecting you to help him? 
Folks, this is fodder for scandal. Imagine what the neighbors would say. Imagine what your friends would say. Imagine what the the family would say, especially the other children, or maybe even your spouse. I can see myself having this conversation with my wife. And here I am wanting to help this boy. And she's like, can't you see what's going on? He's only here because he's out of money. He's using you. You're enabling him. He doesn't deserve this. He deserves tough love. And the thing is, I couldn't argue with that. She's exactly right. Furthermore, I don't know what I would do in that situation. But look at the boy's actions. Look at how he showed contempt for me personally, our family, and everything that we believe in. I don't know what I would do. But I know what the father in the story did. While his son was still a long way off, the father saw him. And ran to him and hugged him and kissed him and threw him a spare no expense party. A party that that has never been seen in that household before because the older son was complaining about it. They'd never done this before. So this very wealthy, influential person goes all out. Today it's the equivalent of renting the old Atlanta club and doing one of those $150 plate affairs and getting the DJ from the hottest club in Atlanta and you are having a party. Imagine that going down today. That person you know that's worth millions of dollars goes through all that trouble to liquidate everything they had worked for, or at least half of it, and give it to this son who went out and blew it, clubbing, prostitutes, you name it, went out and just squandered it, comes back, and now they're throwing a party. What in the world are people thinking? And he's on social media, man. He's telling everybody all about it. What are people saying? I'll tell you what they're saying. He's doing what? After the shameful things that he did? After he squandered half our wealth in debauchery? After he brought that kind of shame onto our family? Father's doing what? Has he lost his mind? Is he absolutely crazy? Somebody needs to have a talk with him. Somebody needs to stop the madness. But there's something else going on that doesn't even translate in our culture. Because the father took and he put the finest robe on him. Which represents the father's provision. And then he went... And he put a ring on him. And the ring that he put on him represents the father's name and his authority. And so what's going on that we don't pick up on because we don't have this type of dynamic in our culture is that the son is being received back into the household. You see, he's not just going to be a common servant. He's not going to go out and, and work the fields. Because he's a son. And aside from his inheritance, his entire life is restored to him. And so, the older son has a talk with the father. And it's the talk that honestly, everybody wants him to have. And the father is being confronted with logic and reason and righteousness and and all of these things. And and he just starts babbling all this sentimentality. Or at least from the, the older son's perspective, that's what it sounds like. Oh, oh, this son of mine was dead. 
but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. And the older son can't say anything. But we know what he's thinking. Because it's what everybody's thinking. The old man has lost his mind. This is crazy. This is absolutely scandalous. And again, this image, when we, when we really drill down into it, is one that, that we're not necessarily all that comfortable with. Again, those of us with the high view of the sovereignty and glory of God, because this image here makes the Father, hence God, look weak and pathetic. God is being pictured here as this this broken-hearted father waiting with bated breath for this loser entitled son who has completely taken advantage of him, you know, just waiting for him to come home so that he can lavish all his love on him and, and, and bring him back in. If we knew somebody like that today, if you or I knew somebody like that, we would think he was being taken advantage of. Those are all the thoughts that we would have, and don't deny it. You would, you would think those things. And that's the way God looks here. But again, we have to remember, the purpose of the text is not to teach the glory and sovereignty of God. It's intended to communicate God's incredible, infinite love towards his wayward children. It is intended to communicate his grace. And I just want to quickly highlight three lessons of grace that we find in this particular passage. The first one is that God, God loves us, the Father loves us with a profound and perfect love. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more. There is nothing you can do to make God love you less. The father in the story never stopped loving the son. And as sinful and shameful and disgraceful and as offensive as his behavior was, the father's love continued to burn bright. He always wanted him home. He always wanted him well. And he knew he couldn't coerce the son. He knew that this was a decision the son had to make for himself. But as soon as his son turned his face towards home, the father was there ready to welcome him home with open arms. Now, again, this is scandalous for some of the the, especially for some of the religious among us. You know, when I say that, I say it in a negative way. You know, those people who think that, that God loves me or God loves me more because I go to church, because I have a, a quiet time, because I teach Sunday school, because I give money to the poor, because I go on mission trips. Or those people who think that God doesn't love or loves people less because maybe they're disobedient and disrespectful to their parents like the prodigal son was. Or people who do drugs or people who sleep around or become prostitutes or, or commit crimes. Well, let me ask you this. Is that what the text is saying? I mean, you tell me. What, is the, what does the text say? The point of the story is that the father's love for the son never wavered. And God's love for you never wavers. He may grieve our behavior because it's self-destructive or because it pulls us away from him. But I'm going to tell you this right now. He always wants us home and he always wants us well. Second truth highlighted by this passage is that God is waiting and willing to forgive us with mercy and compassion. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've done. Again, look at the dynamics in the story. 
I tried to think, I sat down, I, I, I did this mental exercise where I tried to think of something worse that the prodigal could have done. And I'm talking about within reason. You know, like, aside from being a serial killer. I mean, like, what a sane, rational person might do or what someone in the course of our society might do and how they might behave. I tried to think of a way in which someone might be able to be more offensive towards their parents. And I had a hard time thinking of anything. And yet the father never hesitated to welcome his son home. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. The Father is waiting for you to come home. The Father is waiting to lavish his forgiveness on you. He is waiting to show you mercy and compassion and kindness and grace and goodness. He is waiting for you to come to your senses. He is waiting with the robe and the ring. I love the, the imagery and everything it conveys, this passage I have up here in Luke 15, 20. But while he was still a long way off, While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. It doesn't get any better than that. 